Well, we come to the 12th or the last of the minor prophets, of which I know I've said numerous times there's nothing minor about them other than some of their prophecies are shorter. But when you think about the prophets, you're dealing with about a 600 window, 600 year window of time. When you think about the prophets in total from about 1000 BC to 400 BC, roughly that block of time. So Malachi would be the last, the last prophecy or the last voice that God is speaking before we get to the coming of the, the Savior, the, the New Testament. So obviously, uh, Malachi is the author. He's God's man. We really don't know anything about him to speak of other than what we read here in the text. We don't have any other cross-references about his, his life, his lineage. Uh, his name means my messenger. You can see that it, specifically in uh, chapter 3, verse 1, where it says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. So his name, Malachi, means my messenger, and there's a, there's a tie-in to the foreshadowing of John the Baptist being God's messenger or the messenger, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, right? The last of the great prophets declaring, behold, the Lamb of God. And in his own way, Malachi is saying, behold, the coming of the Lamb of God. Ultimately, that is what God is saying through Malachi. And as I've said also before, it must have been a, a phenomenal thing for men set apart of God to be given God's word and be recorded of what was to come. We read it, we, we take it in intellectually and in a spiritual reality, but to think of Zechariah or Hosea or Malachi, given the word of God that was for that moment and for the few years after that or for decades or centuries to come, a stunning reality of the perfection of God giving us the scriptures, right? The word of God through these men. The time period, each of you have different types of Bibles, maybe different types of study helps and study notes. Um, it's estimated around 430 B.C., somewhere in the mid-5th uh, century B.C. We're not really clear on this. Uh, Malachi was probably a contemporary of Ezra and Nehemiah, which were in the mid-5th century B.C., because some of the same types of sins that Malachi is addressing are the exact same phrases or, or similar phrases and sins that Ezra and Nehemiah were dealing with, with the Israelite people and their corruption or their sin. For example, the priesthood had been corrupted. Marriage or being joined to false or to pagan peoples and, and marrying pagan people. That was the sin that was dealt with by Ezra and Nehemiah and is dealt with by Malachi. Um, abusing the disadvantage or taking advantage of people and not paying tithes to God. We'll come back to these as we look at some of the text today. So we're, we're dealing with Malachi addressing the sins of the people in a similar way that we'd seen other men, but in preparing them for what was to come which in this case was the messianic reality of the coming of Christ. So the historic context, um, Malachi's ministry or his prophecy took place around 180 to 100 years after Haggai and Zechariah. And you remember Haggai and Zechariah, what was their thrust? Keep building the temple. God's going to come. Build my place, my dwelling, right? So, 80 to 100 years later, we have Malachi. The temple had been reconstructed. But instead of the days having prosperity and blessing, the days that Malachi is writing in and addressing the people, it was marked by sin and judgment. What some might call spiritual destitution. They were a destitute people in a spiritual sense. They were corrupt. And so they questioned God meaning the people, what about this, what about that? The temple, which had been rebuilt, did not have the visible presence of God's glory in it. It's an interesting note to make. 
because there had been such promises and such things that God had said he was going to do, and he ultimately does everything perfectly like he has said. But the people had grown uh, carnal, evil, and suspect or questioning God, which you'll see is a, a key part of this whole letter or this whole prophecy. So the, the, the waiting or the manifestation of God's glory, which was not present, had caused them to be grumblers or complainers against God. The reason, or the, 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 the temple not having the visible presence of God was not God's failure, it was their failure. It was the sin of the people. So that's an important thing to note from the beginning to the end of what Malachi is addressing. I've, hopefully some of you had a chance to read it this week. Uh, I know Jeff sent a, a brief note out, but it's a short prophecy, four chapters. And would anybody like to comment on what's the main theme? If you put it in your words, what would you say this is the main theme? Okay, fearing the Lord. Anybody else? Jeff, will say something. Okay, that's a good one. Return to me and I'll return to you. That's a good one. Anybody else? Charity? I'm sorry? Loyalty. It's a good word. Those are good. Um, I've I put it in this phrase. Since each book is about the glory of God, I, I state it this way. God's glory in His call to reform His people and prepare them from the coming of the Messiah. That God's glory is at stake here. So He's calling the people to turn to Him. If you wanted to say turn and be loyal, as Charity said, turn and give their complete allegiance to the living God, the one true God, and prepare for the coming of the Messiah. Remember again, this is the last Old Testament book. The last prophecy. 400 years as they used to say in radio speak, of radio silence, if you want to call it that. God is never silent. God is always displaying His glory. But in the, the redemptive plan of God, Malachi is the last call to the people to turn to the one true God because the coming of the Messiah is it's imminent. It's coming. And it's not for us to question God's timing of things, right? And we do. When about this... How long, O oh Lord, as David would write. But yet, God's redemptive plan, His, His total tapestry of His plan for humanity and the glory of Christ and saving a people to Himself, not changed one iota. Nothing out of sequence. But the main theme is God's glory to call the people to reform or turn from their ways and prepare for the Messiah. Secondary themes, I'll mention a couple. Y'all have already mentioned some. Don't be arrogant and question God. I didn't know any other more gentle way to put it. <laughs> Don't be arrogant and question God. Another secondary theme. Wrong attitudes and wrong actions are an offense to God. Whether you're a priest or you're just one of the normal people in His assembly. Wrong attitudes and wrong actions are an offense to to our great God. So the people were being warned of this throughout all, essentially all of these prophetic writings. Over hundreds of years. Same theme. Same theme. Come back to turn to God. Obey God. Keep His covenant requirements. The literary feature of the book. It's a little different. And y'all have probably already noted this. <clears throat> the 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 style of it is not your normal sequence of oracles that deal with coming judgment and promised blessings. We see that as a pattern in so many of the minor prophets and even the bigger, some of the bigger prophetic books. But coming, what the normal pattern has been is that God gives these oracles that there's, there's coming judgment and there's promised future blessings. That's not necessarily the style here. The dominant style here is satire. There is a series of six disputations. Really, at different, at different Bibles or different study helps you'll find 
some that deal with this really clearly and some don't address it as much. But the book or the prophecy of Malachi is six disputations. Excuse me there. What is a disputation? Exactly. Comes from dispute. Six disputes. You get into a dispute with God, you're going to lose every time. Right? We, we, never, we never can pin anything on God. Why do you do this? What about this? What about that heathen guy? How about the timing of this? I didn't get my fair share here. What are you going to do in the future? How about this? What are you going to do with America? What about our economy? Who's going to be the president? Don't go there. You can't dispute with God. And so if, if there was one huge takeaway from the book of Malachi is for us to not question God. And, that, and I'm talking about children of God. We're talking about sons and daughters of the Most High. Even at the end there with the Lord Jesus, you know, them asking Him questions and, and questions He would or would not answer to their liking. You, you don't understand what I'm trying to say. So the dominant style here is satire and particularly six of these disputes between God and the people. The phrase in the ESV, the phrase, but you say, the people, God's referring to, you say this, and then God gives the answer. The, uh, in, the, in the King James it says, and ye say. But the phrase is, it's a question. But you're saying, or you're questioning, and we see that nine times in this book of Malachi. The object of God's correction is their half-hearted religious service. That's really, what is God focused on? Their half-hearted, if that, religious service duty. And we see this in the, a series of questions and answers. The people have questions, and God answers, answers with accusation. Now, one of the great books in the Old Testament deals with this is the book of Job, right? Question after question after question. When God finally answers, He answers emphatically, infinitely greater and, and more uh, full and perfect than we could even grasp. So we'll, we'll look at these here in a second. I want to take gleanings from all six of the disputes between the children of Israel and God's correcting them. The outline of the book, chapter 1, verse 1 is the opening where God identifies the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. In chapter 4, the last three verses, 4, 5, and 6, is the conclusion. So having an opening and a conclusion, and in between, starting in chapter 1, verse 2, we have the first of six disputa disputations. Got to get this word down, right? To dispute with God. Chapter 1, if you just want to look at these quickly, and I'll, I'll just take them in blocks, but then we'll come back. The first disputation starts in chapter 1, verse 2 to verse 5. What's the dispute? Does God distinguish between good men and evil men? Does it really matter, Stephen? I mean, does God really see all? Come on. We just live and we die and we, we bury people like we did this week. And it's, we just all live and die and it's, there's really no difference. I mean, there's many ways to God. We can all get there. Or we, can, we can be religious if we want to. It doesn't matter. Hardly. But the first dispute is, does it really matter between what good men or evil men do? Then we pick up the second disputation. And that starts in chapter 1, verse 6, goes all the way into chapter 2, verse 9. It's really one continuous correction of God. What's it dealing with? God does not take pleasure in polluted offerings. That's the word the ESV uses. Impure. Offerings that are blemished, that are wrong. So, he's going to deal with both the people and the priest. And we'll look, at, we'll look at pieces of that here in a minute. Now, along the way, you're going to think, Clint and Jeff and Tommy, y'all are going to think things that I've been thinking for the last several days. You're going to think, this applies to how we live our Christian life. Half-heartedness. All right, Jeff, I'll help you with that. Good grief. Can't you pull this off yourself? 
you know, things, you, we, we find ourselves in our own way grumbling, half-hearted. And beloved brethren, the Christian life is all in. God is an all in God, right? The first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Put it in the New Testament language with the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt have no other Lord and Savior other than me. And so that comes to bear when we're talking about offerings, we're talking about our whole, our life is an offering, right? We present ourselves. We're... Disputation number three picks up in chapter 2, verse 10. And goes to verse 16. The picture of spiritual adultery where the people join to pagan people. This marriage to idolaters. And then the picture of corruption in true marriage. Husband to wife. The sin of divorce. If you read marriage books, marriage counseling material, they'll often take you to Malachi. Because the picture is here and pretty Pretty graphic language. Does God make, take marriage seriously? Do I even need to ask the question? Forget what the American culture thinks, other than we need to speak truth to them. Marriage is the picture of one God with one people. and That, that, that answers it. So, God speaks to them on that. I mean, you see, they're wondering, where's God's glory in the temple? And they're living with, in such wickedness. <clears throat> Disputation number four, chapter two, verse 17 is where it picks up. And it goes into chapter three, verse five. What's disputation number four about? Judgment, God's judgment against adultery and other moral sins. Not just the sin of putting away wives and then wrong relationships with others, but he's even going to address other sins. I mean, look at this, God is just pinning them. The, the dispute is not a dispute, right? There's only one. God is just declaring their, what their wrong is, their sin is. It's not as though they have any grounds to argue with. Even in Moses' case, when he pled with God, when we go back to that, when, if you want to say, when we say ar Moses argued with God, he was trying to argue or appeal to God based upon the character of God and God's name with his people. It has nothing to do with this here. The people are in complete sin. <clears throat> sin and wrong. Disputation number five. Pick it up in chapter three, <clears throat> verses six through twelve. Robbing God. What do I mean by that? Withholding or giving wrong offerings. Begrudgingly. Begrudgingly. And Beloved, the little box we keep over there, let it only be a joy. Whatever any, anybody would ever want to put in that box, just let it be a joy. <laughs> Cheer, be, be cheerful about it. That's the opposite here that what God was dealing with, with the people. Begrudging offerings. And God speaks to that. Then last dispu disputation, number six, chapter three, verse 13, through chapter four, verse three. So the rest of chapter, thir uh, ja chapter 3 into the beginning part of chapter 4. And again, he comes back to a similar theme. The distinction between the righteous and the wicked. Is it worth serving God now or at the end? What would happen to a man who's followed God or followed Jesus Christ versus a man who's lived in his own way? God gives some pretty clear language terms here about the end of all men. And then the conclusion, the last three verses, four, five, and six, there at the end of Malachi. So let's take some gleanings on the disputations. Go back to chapter one. By way of reminder, the first dispute is, does God distinguish between good and evil? The good and evil men, their conduct. Look at verse two, and we'll read two through five. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, there's the first time, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and I laid his mountains in his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. 
Whereas Edom saith, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw down. And they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. Verse 5, And your eyes shall see, and ye shall say, The Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. Does God distinguish between the good and the evil? Interesting here because the, the subject of Jacob and Esau. We're talking about two lines, two paths, two peoples. And ultimately, the question is, does it really matter? I mean, God distinguishes between one or the other, and the subject of the Edomites comes up. You'd have to put it, in, and some of you are going to have, if you have a real extensive ESV study Bible, you'll see a long few, a couple of paragraphs. It's good. It's very helpful. But you'd have to put it in a bigger picture. The Edomites, there appeared to be a season where the Edomites were not being dealt with. And yet eventually, they were destroyed. They were dealt with by God's judgment. And so, so in Malachi's writing, the question of the Edomites, does their evil does their idolatry, does their, do their sins cost them? And what Malachi is saying is, yes, with God it does. God sees all. God knows all. For you young people, for you children, for all of us, God sees all and knows all. And he says here, when men say, ah, we're going to build our big places and do great things. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down In other words, God will reign over that. If I ask you, if you've been Christians for years, if I ask you of friends of yours who you were in, not in the faith or people you used to know, if I ask you how has their life gone, you would give sad pictures, stories of what their life has turned out to be. Where else could we go for life? Right? God gives grace to sinners and brings us into His kingdom, and then our, our days and our conduct and the fruits of our lives do matter. And the fruits of the lives of wicked men, can't even call them fruit, the deeds in the end bring them to destruction. Some in their teenage years, some in their 20s, some in their 50s, some in their 90s. But the end of all men is under God. That's what disputation number one is about. And the, the Israelites are, well, God, you're not dealing with other men. Does it really matter? Yes, it does. The second dispute picks up in verse 6. We're still in chapter 1. God rejecting or a God abhorring polluted offerings. I'm going to read 6, 7, and 8, and then I'm going to jump over to chapter 2. Stay with me. A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? You see God's question? I'm the God of the people. Where's the honor that I deserve? And if I be master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you. O priests that despise my name. And ye say, here we go again, wherein have we despised thy name? Verse 7. You offer polluted bread upon mine altar. And you say, wherein have we polluted thee? And that ye say the table of the Lord is contemptible. Verse 8. And if you offer the blind for sacrifice, is it not evil? They would take animals, offerings that were not pure, not unblemished. They would bring, if you want to call it, rejected offering material. And if you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it now unto the governor. Will he be pleased with thee or accept thy person? Saith the Lord of hosts. We'll stop there. Polluted offerings, corrupt offerings, things that were being brought that were clearly against the Mosaic law. And the priests were allowing it. Turn over to chapter 2. Again, this is one disputation. There's a lot of text relative to the entire book here that deal with this topic. The corruption of what they offered or what they were bringing to God. Pick it up. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now he speaks to the priest. And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. 
If you will not hear and if you will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already because you do not lay it to heart. We hear that state, lay it to heart. You're not listening to me. You're not taking heed to me. Boy. Verse 7. This is in chapter 2, verse 7. For the priest's lips should keep knowledge, and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. What is a priest but the messenger of God, right? A servant of God. Verse 8. But you have departed out of the way. You have caused many to stumble at the law. You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Verse 9. Therefore have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people, according as ye have not kept my ways, but have been partial in the law. Half-hearted, wrong offerings, wrong sacrifices, wrong obedience, Whatever, half-hearted never pleases God. The Christian life is not half-hearted. The Old Testament is over and over correcting the wrong view. America, in Christendom at large, lets anything go under the umbrella of Christian. And you put it to the test according to Scripture, and you can almost use phrases here from Malachi. You can do this. Oh yeah, you can do that. Drinking and partying is not a big deal. You can still be a Christian. You can move in with people and commit all kinds of sins. You can cheat on your tax return. You can use curse words at times when you struggle or whatever. And on and on and on and on and on. It doesn't really matter. You know, God's, God's big flowery. No big deal. Nobody buries anybody that just went into eternal damnation. That never happens anymore. This is an old book. Come on. It's like when I'm saying it, we're all thinking, man, Philip, what? It's kind of a wake up, isn't it? I've said throughout all of these minor prophets, it'd be amazing to take segments of this and walk into the Congress of the United States and just read it in a more contemporary language and just read it and then sit down. And then to ask him, nobody in this room say a word. Just listen to it. They pass laws that allow abomination in our land. So the point is, these truths are calling men, including the Israelites, to repent and turn to God. The implication is they don't know the true God. They don't have heart circumcision. They don't know Him. And the priests were corrupt in their ways. God said, I'm going to make you an embarrassment, a basement. I'm going to abase you in front of the people. Hmm. This, the fourth, catch up to myself, I'm sorry. I'll have to move on here. The third dispute, pick it up in verse 11. The third dispute is about marriage or being joined to the pagan people and them committing divorce. So we've dealt with so far, does God see good and evil? Yes. Will evil men's deeds be Brought into judgment? Absolutely. Does God see His people? Does grace abound? Toward? Yes, it does. Second, does God see the offerings? Half-heartedness? Duplicity? Hypocrisy? Yes, He does. Number three, does God see covenant love to Him and covenant love to each other is significant? Yes, He does. Chapter 2, verse 11. Judah hath dealt treacherously, and an abomination is committed in Israel. And in Jerusalem, for Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved, and hath married the daughter of a strange God. That, that scene, that phrase, this truth has been seen so many times in these prophetic books. Being joined to pagan peoples, pagan idols, and their practices. It is, if you want to simplify it, commandment number one being disobeyed blatantly. One true God being turned away from and being joined to false gods. And then, so this marriage to idolaters, pick it up, then it carried over. Why would we think in our land with such a, such a non-view of the one true God, why would we think that it wouldn't affect the view of marriage in our land? It only goes to 
bigger because marriage, the covenant love between man and wife, is God-centric. It's about Christ. It's about the kingdom of God, ultimately, marriage. And so when nobody fears the Lord, they don't have any high view of marriage. How can they? Think of the, connect, think of the theology of that. A low view of God creates a low view of so many areas. Marriage. Why even marry? What is a man? What is a woman anymore? We're just beings. You talk about sick stuff, beloved. This is sick. It's all over our land. Verses 14 through 16. Here we go again. You say, or but you say, wherefore? Now he's going to deal with them divorcing. Because the Lord hath been witness against you and the wife of your youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. What does it say in the ESV? Treacherously? What, what is it? Faithless. You've been cruel. Faithless. You've turned away. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant? And did not he make one? Yet he hath the residue of the Spirit. And wherefore one? That he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth you hear that? He hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. The idolatry of departing from the living God had carried over that they were putting away the wife of their youth, the covenant love between a husband and a wife. And it was hatred to God. God hated it. And he speaks so pointedly here, God does, against the Israelites for doing this. The wife of your youth. So, the, the positive side. The wife of our youth. What a precious thing. You young ladies, you young men, if you haven't married yet, leave today again with a high view of God and a high view of marriage. You know, Brother David, we've been blessed with many years of marriage. Mac and I have. And children and grandchildren. Hopefully for you soon, God willing. And it's precious. But sometimes when I, I actually look at society and I look at the, the abominable ways, how it goes with people that depart, they have no submission, allegiance to this truth of God. It does not go well. It does not. Disputation number four. We'll go to chapter three. Moral sins. <clears throat> I'll pick it up in chapter three, verses one and two. Behold, I send my messenger. Now this is, as I mentioned at the beginning, Malachi, my messenger. That's what his name means. Behold, I will send my messenger and he shall prepare the way before me. Like John the Baptist, right? Coming. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to His temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, He shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. Verse 2, But who may abide the day of His coming? And who shall stand when He appeareth? For He is like a refiner's fire and full of fuller's soap for refining. Jump down to verse 5. It's talking about God sending His messenger. And I will come near to you. Here is he's dealing with moral sins, calling it out. A refiner's fire. Not a small thing, is it? And I will come near to you and to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against false swearers and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside to the stranger from his right. And fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts, for I am the Lord, and I change not. Which means the same list in that day was true a month later, a hundred years later, and thousands of year later, years later today. God sees, God is a witness against the sin of man. And God is pointing this out to the Israelites. The moral sins of the people God would deal with. A refiner's fire. Anybody had to work close to hot fires before? 
I was a stalker at Piggly Wiggly in 1982 and 83. And it was on the south side of Denton when I was finishing undergrad school. And back then when we would stock, we would break the boxes down and we had an incinerator in the back room. I'm not even sure that stuff's legal anymore because now all the recycling and stuff. But So at the end of stocking your aisle, you would roll your cart back there and you would open that door and start putting those boxes in. I'm, I'm telling you, beloved, I'm, I'm convinced sometimes I got lightly got skin, got burned opening that door. And then you're trying to throw those boxes in. And it's preaching to you. It preaches. The refiner's fire is serious. The Lord Jesus said, And these shall go away into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Sin is real. The sins at congressmen, the sins at governors, the sins in high schools, the sin across the land is real. God sees and will deal with men. And that's what He says in the book of Malachi. That's what He says in 66 books of the Bible. God's judgment. Disputation number five. Begrudging God of offerings. You know, we don't, Mac and I've said this to each other through the years, we rarely, rarely ever in 17 years have ever even alluded to anything about the joy or the blessing of giving. Right, Jeff? You know, Jeff's been here, and Tommy, we've been here most all of these years, many of them. And it's not like we dwell on this. But there's a biblical beauty and rightness to it, right? Giving cheerfully, the New Testament language, setting aside, giving to the kingdom. And all. But here, we have the, the antithesis of that, where we have the people robbing God, holding back. Strong language, isn't it? Robbing God. Unfortunately, televangelists and other pastors for decades have corrupted this, and they use it to, co to coerce people, to put pressure on people. You know, we got to get some big building program, we don't, so and so. And so they, they apply it, or they force upon people wrongly. Let the Holy Spirit lead you. But here, what God had commanded the people in Old Testament requirements, they had abandoned. They had not been faithful in. We've already talked about blemishes and polluted offerings. Pick it up, verse 8, chapter 3. Will a man rob God? Oh, that's a rhetorical question. Yet you've robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. What does it say in the ESV? How's it put that? What's the phrase there? End of verse 8. Contributions, okay. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. No wonder men like to use this text for a building program. That would be wrong. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Now you'll see this nicely printed on a nice little card, you know used in a positive light. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing or pour out on you a blessing that there shall be room enough to receive it. If you take verse 10 and apply it wrongly, you miss the force. God's saying, you've robbed me, but if you come to me with the right heart and you do it my way, I'll take care of you. And then some. George Mueller comes to mind, doesn't he? And others. Amy Carmichael. Hudson Taylor. They believed God, trusted God, and God would send in. Even Whitfield at times would get something just out of nowhere. Which would have been mailed maybe 10 or 14 weeks earlier. And it came the day the need was there. God will take care of His people. But here... The people, the Israelites, were robbers of God. Any lost man in the world today, every lost man, is a robber of God. They withhold to God what is due Him and Him alone. But the people of God should never be robbers of Him. Children, your life is not your own. All that you are is His. It's not yours to say, I get to do this and I'm going to do this. This is what I'm going to do with my life. Nobody get in my way. I'm going to do my way. Do what I want to do. Privately, publicly, professionally. You better get rid of that idea right now. 
I do you a big favor to say to you today, do not leave this building holding on to that anymore. That little girl in dad's arms needs to hear that. She can't hear it yet, but she needs to hear that. Her life is not her own. It's not hers to hang on to. Robbing God through begrudging offerings. You know, when, when we get right down to it, it gets down to, you know, this old washing machine is just a piece of junk. Why do I have to use this thing? Or I'm not going to be content with this. I'm going to withhold this. Or I'm going to, I'm going to grudge, begrudging God. Man, the old car I have, the doggone alternator is still giving me trouble. What's God doing in this? This isn't fair. <laughs> We, it's right where we live, isn't it? We can begrudge God in other ways. I need grace here. I'm not, I'm not speaking as one who's finished the race. I need grace. You brothers need grace. We all do. Disputation number six. Let's take a glance at it. Chapter 3, verse 13. 13 and 14. How does God see the lives of the wicked versus the lives of the righteous? Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. What a phrase. Your words, your arguments, your questioning of me has been stout, has been pretty big. Yet you say, what have we spoken? So much against thee. Verse 14. You have said, it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept His ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before Lord of hosts? You see the question here? Any of us, all of us, never question if it's really worth following Christ. It's, a, it's an impossible question when you really think about it. Throw it out. Is it really worth serving God? Is it worth really getting up early and setting up chairs? Is it, in Brian Elsie's case, is it worth being up late and helping to do the book work? Or Jeff preparing for preaching? Or Mac making a late home visit? Or somebody going to the hospital? Or you ladies making that food and, and doing that? The gospel, saints, goes out like that. All of it's worth it. How could, you ever, how could we ever say, is it worth serving God? Look down at chapter 4. I mean, they, that's the question. I mean, is it really? Is it worth this? Or what about the wicked? Huh. Well, let chapter 4 speak to this. For behold, the day cometh that the, they shall burn as an oven. We're talking about the wicked men of the earth. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. Remnants just blowing away. Next time you go this week and you see those guys blowing the weed trimmings off the pavement, remember the word of the Lord. They'll be blown away as stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Nothing left. <laughs> well, then what about the righteous? They're not stubble. They're not in the fire. They're not the boxes I threw in the incinerator. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in His wings. And ye shall go forth and grow up as calves in the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. By the way, the Lord of hosts is mentioned in this book more than any of the other prophetic books, the, the minor prophets. The Lord of hosts. Over and over, saith the Lord of hosts. Does God deal with the righteous differently than He does the wicked? Absolutely, without exception, in His perfect way. Let me finish with some great truths for us to, to see. One of, one of the things that I've wanted to do, each of these minor prophets, 
And I've been doing it even today as I'm speaking. I know I, I tend to launch off, don't I? I take off on something that's really not even in my notes. But I want to, what is the takeaway for us? These are not just books of history. They're books that are living and active. God's speaking. Four great truths for us to see. Number one, be careful on how you or I ask questions to God. Be careful. Right? We, there, it's just natural in, in our Christian life that we're, we are asking God, Lord, help me to see this. Bring me through this. I want, I want to know. I want to know Your will. I need, I need You to lead me. Help me, Lord. That's different. But it's this thing of questioning God that we see here in, the, in this book. The, the disputes of the people that, does God really know what He's doing? Does He really know what He's doing for Alan and Legia? I mean, there seems to be some things. I'm not sure God's got this one right. See, beloved, it's, it's that kind of thinking. So we have to be careful in how we ask questions to God. You young people, be, be, be careful. If you stay single for two years, ten years, twenty years, let God reign. Love Christ. Walk with Him. Sometimes women can't bear children as quick as they had hoped for. Don't begrudge God. It's real. We live it. We walk by faith. We don't walk by sight. We have to believe God. We don't need to question God. His ways are perfect. He doesn't need man's opinion. He need not need our conjecture. I often find myself saying to you or others that I meet at times at work, they'll ask me some big question and I'll say, I don't know. I don't know what God's doing in that. Who am I to fill in the blank? On Wednesday when we, the ladies had done all the food prep and we went after the funeral or the graveside and we went to the reception to be with family and some family from Oklahoma, Right out there by where we were having it is the car repair place, that, the guy that does things for our cars, and I've been needing to get Chris's car dealt with. And so I thought, I'm five minutes away. I called him, yeah, bring it to me now. Went to see him. I have a towel on. I walk in. I'm not, I don't look like I should be going to the oil change shop. But he had heard on my phone call that Chris's dad had passed, and he remembered her mother had passed. That's the setup, all right? Stay with me here. Nobody's at the shop. Him... He's about my brother's age, so I've known him since I was a teenager. He's 60 now. And two young workers. And I walk in, I walk to the counter, and he says, what did she, what'd her dad die of? I tried to tell him. It went quickly. It was difficult. Parkinson's, and he was diabetic, and he, Alzheimer's, etc. It was, it was rough. Last two months was rough. And he wasn't looking at me, and he said, I don't understand why God does these kinds of things. As Piper would say, you're at a point right then, you've got to say something. What are you going to say? I didn't have any preparation. David, I didn't have any notes to work from. What are we going to say to a guy that's going to question God? You know what I said? I said it was hard. It was hard watching him decline, but I know this. Everything God does is perfect. Everything that He does is right. And that guy didn't say a word. And his young attendant was standing there. Nobody said another word. That's all I knew to say. Who are you to question God? If I die from Parkinson's in six months, are you going to question God? Remember what I said. God doesn't need opinions. He doesn't need our president or some ninth grade kid or some rock star or some pop freak to, tell, to question God. Be honest with you, beloved. He doesn't need that. They need to hear more warnings like that. So we have to be careful. And we have to have grace to know how to answer somebody, right? It wasn't, it wasn't a, necessarily a, a moment I wanted to have at that time. But I had to say something. Questioning God? What am I going to say? Yeah, you're right, man. My, my father-in-law got a raw deal. I don't know what God's up to. Mm -mm. Second, another great truth for us to see. Obedience and devotion to God is right. It's our, it's our calling. It's who we are. But it's a witness to a lost and perishing world. God's concern for His people is that they would be a testimony, a living witness of God, the one true God, for His namesake, for His honor, for His renown, for His fame in all the earth. We want to use that word. His glory to be shed abroad. 
obedience and devotion to God, ours, is to be a witness to a lost and perishing world. That people that would see your lives would say, Christ is worth everything to live like, if they're going to live like that. He must be glorious. This was true in the Old Testament. Israel was, Israelites were God's people. Therefore, they were to live reflecting the one true God. But in the New Testament reality, all shall know the Lord. Right? All have the Holy Spirit. All have Christ. Every redeemed, converted, born anew creature in Christ Jesus. And therefore, the Christian in the New Testament is to shine forth, to be salt and light, to have gospel witness to their life. Whether you're in an old chain shop or whether you're with each other or thousands of other scenarios at an airport, in an airplane. Lee and Jeff and I sitting on one side. Mac was sitting next to the guy when we flew back. The big muscle guy that Mac was sitting next to. And Jeff said, here goes Mac. He's got him. And, you, and it seems like y'all had a delightful conversation. And Mac was so in truth to him. Salt and light. God willing, this week I'll be on an airplane with one of my daughters. And we need to be salt and light. They need to hear Christ in a dad and a daughter talking. Love. A, a redemptive view. Number three. Marriage is a holy covenant to God. The book of Malachi resoundingly declares that, doesn't it, brother? Marriage is is a holy covenant to God. It's not a small thing. Krista and her brother are dealing with all kinds of legal documents, and those are important, and they have their place, and they're important in God's economy. But I tell you what, my marriage license and my marriage covenant to Krista is a lot more important than some of those papers and forms and all that they're having to deal with right now. We're talking a whole different level. Marriage is precious to God, if I could say it that way. It portrays God's relationship to His people. One God, one people. Love and serve me. He is faithful. We're to be faithful. New Testament language is marriage is precious to God and it testifies of the love and the reality of Jesus Christ with His people. Husbands, you are to shine forth the glory of Jesus Christ and how you relate to your wives. Okay, brother? You, I, I'm in this. I'm with you. We do. Sisters, how you relate to your husbands and how you view your covenant love and your relationship has redemptive messages to it. It's a billboard. It's a walking testimony. It's not a secondary thing. Malachi has made that clear. God has spoken. It's, he abhors when that covenant love is put aside, corrupted, walked away from, defiled. You get the picture. And number four, the last great truth I want us to take away. Is there any difference between the ways of the wicked and the righteous? If we had time to read Psalm 73, I would just say, I'll let, I'll let Asaph take care of this one. I looked at the wicked. Oh man, their eyes bulge. They got so much food and they got those fast cars. They got slick clothes and great haircuts. Man, they even got some cool tattoos. They're just, I mean, they, they are just awesome. The ways of the wicked. Women and money and booze and power. Matthew McConaughey or whatever his name is kind of guys. Man, they're cool. They need Jesus Christ. You kidding me? Matthew McConaughey? What's it, how do you say his last name? McConaughey? Hugh or McConaughey? Something? He, if he was here, we should love him. We should draw him in. Is there any difference between the way of the wicked and the righteous? Yeah. Does God see? Does God care? Yes, He does. I just read it there in chapter 4, the first few verses. Beloved, God is abounds towards His children. We, we are His workmanship. We are to live for His glory. The wickedness of men is not only God belittling or God despising, it's eternal in its consequences. One of the schools in Denton is named after a former man. I'm not going to use names because I wouldn't want this to necessarily get out in the wrong sense. And Jesse asked me about it. He said, oh yeah, yeah, I, I remember him. He said, how'd, 
had one of the children that was my age. Basically didn't get out of high school. Drugs. Oh, saints, the way of the wicked and the way of the righteous are in God's sight. Yeah. So we take that away. We see that again here. Well, I've said a lot. Anybody have thoughts or input or questions? Yes, brother. So, yeah, it's something that's a that's partial or I think maybe the equivalent would be holding back or not having a joyful view towards all that I have is God's. I'm going to give him my best of my life, all that I am, my resources, my energies, I'm Jonathan Edwards, I'm going I'm to buff it or keep myself in such a way that I can honor God. I'm not going to half-heartedly do anything. I'm not going to hold anything back. I think it'd be fuller than just giving tithing or you know, offerings or special gifts. It might even be something like if you see somebody in need and you could help and you just don't even pay attention to it. And we have to be discerning. I'm not talking in every person on a street corner, but I think the bigger principle is holding back from God what to do Him. Other questions or feedback? The book of Malachi. Just a sleepy little book, right? Boy, what these prophetic books, these great books. So we've been through the 12 and we'll see what's ahead. Thank you all for your attention. And as we've gone through them, let me pray. Father, we do thank You for Your servant Malachi, Your messenger. Grateful to come back to it, read it. Behold the Lord of hosts speaking, correcting men's questions, men's disputes. Lord, we want to take heed to ourselves to learn from it and to trust You and to submit to You. Great is our God, You're good. And our lives are Yours to be spent for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Keep us today. Feed us now. Make the worship time full of praise and truth. Lord, we ask through Christ. Amen.